uh, welcome to this course on stochastic modeling. Uh, in this lecture, we will deal with random box. Random box find wide application in modeling, uh, scientific, engineering, and uh, um, problems in social sciences. Random box can be um, uh, in other way called as a, a Brownian motion problem in a discrete domain. So, uh, consider a one-dimensional axis in which uh, a particle moves in such a manner that it always occupies only certain discrete positions. And we will denote it as uh, uh, integers, which can take uh, uh, zero, positive, or negative values. So the position of the particle is either 0 or 1 or 2 or minus 1, minus 2 at any given time. So the way it moves in this one dimensional axis is random in nature. We can also extend it to have multidimensional random box. So in this simplest one dimensional random box, you have a particle which at any given time moves either to its left or to its right in a given step. So we view this motion in terms of steps or unit um, uh, time and the motion is always a one step to the left or one step to the right. So suppose the particle is at a node i then it can go to the node i plus 1 or i minus 1 in one step, one time unit. It goes to the uh, node or position i plus 1 with the probability say p and i minus 1 with the probability 1 minus p. Which means that in one time unit or one time step, it cannot go uh, to a node which is uh, twice the unit distance time. Uh, okay, So it can only go one step to the right or left, not more than that. So we can represent this uh, motion probabilistically using the probability that a particle which is found at a time in the position or the node i to move to the node or position i plus 1 as p i i plus 1 in unit time, that 1 being drop in the subscript. So p i i plus 1 denote the probability of making a transition from the position i to the position i plus 1. We can also identify this position as the state of the particle. So if you view it as the stochastic process, we can first note that this is a discrete state space process because the value that can be taken by the random variable is the position or the node which is discrete in nature. Then we observe it at only discrete time points. So it is a discrete state, discrete time stochastic process. Further we assume that given that it is in the position i, the probability that it goes to i plus 1 or i minus 1 is independent of how it arrived at i. So given the present state as i, the future evolution are independent of the past uh, states occupied by the stochastic process. Therefore, it boils down that it has been memoryless or the Mar it obeys the Markov property. So this one step transition probability is given by this two simple formulas. P i to i plus 1 is the probability p. P i to i minus 1 has to be 1 minus p because these are the only two possible transitions that can happen in the state i. 
you will call this 1 minus p as q for simplicity. Therefore, p plus q is equal to 1. So this, uh, the name, the random walk came for this kind of a situation because it's very similar or it abstracts the way a drunken man uh, moves. Okay. Uh, the what the uh, man does is because he is so drunk and cannot walk in a steady manner he takes one step to the left or one step to the right uh, with certain probabilities so therefore the walk is random in nature and therefore this phenomenon is called as the random walk if you have looked at the one dimensional brownian motion that one dimensional Brownian motion is a continuous time analog of this random walk. So by looking at the uh, um, behavior or the way the random walk uh, behaves and the dynamics of the random walk, much can be understood by the one dimensional Brownian motion. So this one dimensional random walk can be used for modeling a wide variety of scientific engineering and um, social phenomena. Some of them are listed out here. It can be used to model the fluctuations of stock market price of a particular commodity. So it increases and or decreases on a day to day trading and it can be viewed as to be a random walk phenomenon. Or it can be used to model the movement of ions in a, a solid state um, phase. So this hence can be used to look at how ions diffuse. It can also be used for modeling uh, um, how the genetic evolution of a species how the traits get passed on from one generation to another and so on. So the one dimensional random walk can also be uh, is very analogous to our previously described gambler's ruin problem. So with uh, with an idea of the gambler's ruin if you look at the uh, random walk phenomenon the analogy goes as follows. Consider a game of gambling in which the player starts off with an initial fortune. Call the initial fortune as I. This is the amount of money the player carries uh, initially while starting the game. The gambler plays a sequence of uh, trials which each one being called as a gamble which can result in either a win or a loss. When the gambler wins, the gambler gets a one unit of money, in which case the fortune will increase by one. If the gambler loses, then uh, the fortune decreases by one. And in every gamble, the probability of winning or uh, losing, uh, losing the gamble is independent of what happened in the previous trials or gambles and let us say that the probability of winning is say p and probability of losing is therefore q which is 1 minus p. So if you look at the fortune, the fortune uh, represents a, a random variable because at any given time the fortune cannot be predicted but you may be able to assign the probability that the fortune will be a value at a given time for which what you have to know is the initial fortune and how many time stress has elapsed. Then you may be able to come up with the probability mass function of the fortune and this PMF changes as the game proceeds and therefore it is a sequence of random variables which is indexed, indexed by the, uh, the uh, iteration number or the trial number or the gamble number. So 
let us put some more structure into this uh, gambling game uh, so that it uh, can come to an end in a finite amount of time possibly so what the gambler uh, does the gambler plays with an objective to reach a total fortune of say n obviously n is supposed to be a, a very large value but uh, something which also uh, abstracts the greediness or the risk taking ability of the gambler so what the gambler will do is as soon as the fortune hits this value n the gambler gets satisfied and he gets out of the gambling game with that money uh, because the gambler is worried that if he further continue to play the gambler may lose the money so he walks away with the money and that value can be anywhere anything which for this game will call it as a number n on the other hand if the gambler is fortune hits zero that becomes zero then the gambler is not allowed to play further we say the gambler is ruined the reason is if the gambler is ruined and the fortune becomes zero and if a, ga a trial is being conducted and if the gambler loses he will not be able to pay the amount of one unit of money to the casino and therefore uh, the trial will not be allowed so which means that this whole game uh, will stop either when the uh, fortune hits a value capital n or zero so it is not uh, played uh, possibly for an infinite duration but of course it may take with some probability large amount of duration if you view the fortune as the state space of the random variable where the random variable is the fortune at after any given trial so the state space is confined between the values 0 to n then we can also come up with the transition probabilities probability that with in any given trial the fortune goes from i to i plus 1 is p i to i minus 1 is 1 minus p which is q and uh, we can see that this is true for the values of the state between 0 and n not including 0 and n because uh, we know that when if the fortune hits either 0 or 1 the game stops and furthermore game uh, game is not allowed therefore this transition probability doesn't make sense so with this in mind we can come up with the one step uh, transition probability before uh, moving we have defined the transition probabilities for i in between 0 and n what about 0 and n that is at 0 if i is equal to 0 the only state to which it can we can go is 0 only so p 0 0 has to be 1 of course there is no trial but you can simply call that on reaching 0 it remains in 0 with probability 1 similarly p n n is also 1 because the game stops so the transition probability matrix is given here so here recall that i is the former state j is the later state i acts as the index for the rows of this matrix j stands for the index for the columns of this matrix so a given element i comma j uh, implies it is the probability of making a transition in one step from the state i to the state j so the states are numbered from 0 1 2 up to n columns are also numbered from 0 1 2 up to n so this element is p 0 0 which is the probability of going from 0 to 0 that probability is 1 from 0 you cannot go to 1 that this element p01 
is zero. Similarly, all other elements. If you look at the this element in the lower uh, corner of this matrix, this is represents p capital N capital N that is also equal to one. So once it reaches either zero or one, it cannot go to any other state. We will call these states as absorbing states because having reached those states, it will remain there forever. Let us consider a state say one, then along the row corresponding the first row, from if the fortune is one and if a, a trial is conducted and if the gambler loses, the fortune will decrease by one, which means it will go from one to zero. So you can go from one to zero with a probability Q. So this element is P zero one, which is Q. Similarly, if the trial is a win from one, the fortune increases to two. So P one two is this entry, which is P. Note that with an initial fortune, with a fortune of one, after playing the trial, the fortune can never be remain at one. It has to either increase or decrease. Therefore, P11 is zero. Similarly, P22 is zero and so on. So all these diagonal entries, other than the extreme diagonals, are all zeros. The lower diagonal entries are all Qs. The upper diagonal entries, apart from, of course, the two extremes, are all Ps. All other entries in the rows and columns are all zero because fortune cannot change by more than one in any given trial. So this would be the uh, transition probability matrix. So, so this is a Markov chain and uh, we are, once we have got the uh, transition probability matrix, we would like to know how the um, game uh, will proceed and so on. Well, the point that we have to note is that if you try to look at what will happen at stationarity, okay, we will look at more about whether a stationary states exist, whether and all those things. You can see that in long time, we have to be either in the state zero or state one. All other states, okay, cannot be reached or cannot be there in the stationary state. Okay, so all these we will call it as transient states, and there are two absorbing states. That is one thing. Then. Then the only thing that matters is we cannot ask about at stationarity what is the probability that we will be at one, the fortune will be one or five and so on. The only meaningful quantity that we may ask then is what is the probability of the gambler okay, getting ruined or a gambler getting out of the game with a fortune of n. So we will now introduce the notion that if a gambler uh, gets out with a fortune of capital N, we say that the whole, the gambler has won the whole gambling process, not individual trial, the whole gambling process. So there are only two possible events that will occur when the game ends. Either the gambler gets ruined or the gambler wins the gambling, whole gambling game. So the only thing that we can ask is, what is the probability of getting ruined and what is the probability of winning the whole gambling? But of course, it is to be noted, it depends upon several things. One, it depends upon the value of P and value of Q. The probability of winning in a given trial or losing in a given trial. It also depends upon the initial fortune. All these can be seen. So before getting into the answering those questions, it is better to get a pictorial view of the whole dynamics of the random walk. For that, the diagrammatic represent of the Markov chain uh, is very handy. So here is the Markov chain diagram for the gambler's ruin problem. So in the Markov chain, 
each state is represented as a node of the graph. So there are n plus 1 states and these are the values in the state space. So 0, 1, 2, up to n minus 1 n. These are the states or the values the random variable can take at any given uh, after any given trial. So these are the nodes and this graph will have directed arcs from one node to another. So the directed arc means that tells uh, in uh, unit time how the state can be changed. So the, uh, the, uh, the directed arc will point to the node to which a transition will take place from a given node. So the direction of transition is marked by the, uh, the direction along the arc connecting the two nodes. Further, it is a weighted uh, graph. The weightage is nothing but the probability of making the transition. So you can say a Markov chain diagram is nothing but a weighted directed graph. Well, so uh, you can construct this uh, Markov chain graph diagram directly from the state transition probability matrix or from the statement of the problem. Or once you draw this diagram, you can also get back the matrix. We can see all this. As we saw that if you are in a state 0, you will remain in the state 0. So that is indicated by a self loop with a probability 1. Similar from n, you will remain in n. Therefore, there is a self loop with a probability t 1. If you are in 1, in a particular trial, you go to 2 with a probability p or you go to 0 with a probability uh, q. So this is how what happens. Uh, if you are in 2, then from 2 you will go to 3 with a probability p. From 2 you will go to 1 with a probability q. So if you look at all these nodes in between 1 and n minus 1, they are very symmetric that you either move forward by 1 unit. By forward we means increasing uh, values of fortune. So forward transitions with a probability p. By backward transition, we mean the state space decreases by 1. Okay. Later, we can also view it as a birth death process. Uh, but no, we will normally use it in the context of continuous time Markov chain. But they are all very similar. But this is a discrete version of the Markov chain. So now, having got a diagrammatic representation, now we are asked, we have an initial fortune i. What is the probability that so the st uh, as the game proceeds, we will move along the state in the state space randomly, either to the right or to the left, and it keeps on moving. From i, you may slowly go like this, and then come back to two, and then go to five, and then three, seven, nine, two, and so on. You keep on moving like this thing, and. As long as you are in between 1 and n minus 1, you will keep on moving. But once you touch either 0 or n, the game stops. Now we are asking a question, what is the probability that the gambler will get ruined or gamble, gambler will win the whole game? Obviously, it is going to depend upon p and q. Because p and q add up to 1, there is only one independent variable, which we will call it as p. If p is large, okay, you know intuitively that it is possible for the gambler to win the gamble because there are more chances of winning each trial and therefore winning the whole game itself. On the other hand, if q is large, then is the possibility of getting ruined is more. So suppose, imagine that you are uh, going to play this kind of a gamble and uh, suppose the fortune that you have had in your mind is 10 units of money. Then 
you start off playing with uh, initial fortune of say five. Now if you are told by the casino that the P is equal to 0.3, would you like to play such a game? What will be your idea? Obviously it is very likely that you will get ruined. So this would not be a fair game, so you will not play, okay, given an option. But at the other end, if P is 0.8 or 0.7, you will tend to play. But now let us say the casino tells that, okay, for you as you like, we can set P is equal to 0.7, but your initial fortune has to be two then you have to rethink your strategy because you are starting with 2. Of course, P is 0 0.7 or 0 0.8, but two losses, consecutive losses at 2 will get you yourself ruined. But in order to hit N is equal to 10, you have to move, move a lot of your units to the right. So it is also dependent on critically on I. In other words, starting from n minus 1 as the initial fortune, you don't mind playing even with the probability of p is equal to 0.1. Okay? So it all depends upon the initial fortune, p, q, and so on. Now, we will come up to the main problem. So we want to calculate the probability of getting ruin or the probability of winning, okay, given p and therefore Q, of course, and the initial fortune also. Of course, if you calculate the probability of getting ruined, then probability of winning is 1 minus that. So that is obvious. So we will just calculate probability of getting ruined. So first note that uh, we can just, before proceeding to the uh, understanding the gambler's ruin problem, this random walk phenomenon itself can be generalized. So what we have mentioned here is when the system reaches a st state of zero, then it remains there. That is what we talked about in the case of gambler's ruin. But we can generalize and then tell that once the system reaches uh, one extreme value, say zero, then it cannot go further down. Minus one is not allowed. If that is the case, then there is no generalization. It is a then an extension to the infinite uh, one-dimensional axis. So we have to have a cutoff at the lower end and upper end. That much we will fix it. But what happens when you are either at the lower extreme or upper extreme is what you can decide. So suppose you are at zero, the probability of if you lose, then with a probability say A, you remain in zero. Your fortune is not decreased, but you are allowed to remain in that place with uh, the same fortune. That is the gambler now is a redefined game. When the fortune is zero, then if the gambler uh, he starts a different coin is being used if it is a toy causing that is being used to play the one, a different coin is being used to play one. And if the gambler uh, loses, the fortune remains at zero. If the gambler wins, the fortune increases and uh, that probability is one minus zero. Okay, probably this A value may be smaller than what P can be to give an incentive to the gambler to continue playing. Similarly, when the uh, value becomes capital N, we saw that the gambler is interested in coming out, but the casino can give an incentive and telling that to tell that he can instead use a different coin to play where the probability of winning is uh, more, say B. Of course, here the fortune does not change, so there is no incentive for it but there can be a different kind of incentive that can be given. So in general, these need not be an absorbing state. These probabilities 
at these two points can be different. So here P00 is A, P01 is 1 minus A, PNN is B, PNN minus 1 is 1 minus B. So again A and B can be same, then in that case it will be a symmetric phenomenon, it can even be different. Now you will see what happens when A is equal to 1. It means that it is an absorbing state, the previous case. If A is 1, then 1 minus A is 0, then this A 0 becomes an absorbing state. On the other hand, if B is 1, N becomes an absorbing state. What happens if A is 0? Then when you are in a fortune of 0, then in the next trial, then actually there is no trial, you are being upgraded to 1 automatically. So the state from 0 unconditionally becomes 1. You will call this as the reflecting barrier. So here, as soon as you hit a wall, you come back, return back. There is no way to go further beyond that barrier, so you get reflected. So A is equal to 0 or B is equal to 0 are called as the reflecting barrier. Again, instead of 0 or 1, you can set a value of A to be something in between 0 and 1, but may be different from P or Q. So in that case, what happens? On reaching 0, you may either remain in 0 or go to 1 with some probabilities, respective probabilities. Similarly for B. So those are called as elastic barriers or sticky barriers. Sticky to denote you may stick on to that value or elastic means that you may either come back with some uh, probability or remain there. Right. Now we will go back and then look at the uh, traditional gambler's ruin problem where 0 and n are absorbing states. First note that every time a trial is conducted, you can define uh, a Bernoulli random variable. The nth trial can be denoted as capital Xn, that is the random variable denoting the profit of that nth trial. It can take a value only plus 1 or minus 1. So we can construct a stochastic process Xn, n is equal to 0, 1, 2 and so on. So this is nothing but an IID process. So the basic assumption is that the probability of winning or losing any given trial is independent of how the state is being reached. So if you look at the fortune, call it as Sn, this, is, this has to be Sn. We can see that Sn is given by some of these values. I the initial fortune plus delta 1 the profit in the first trial delta 2 the profit in the second trial all the way up to delta n. Delta 1, delta 2, delta n are all IID random variables added with a constant i to get Sn. So Sn, n is equal to 1, 2, 3 and so on are all construed a stochastic process. That process is not an IID process but it is a Markov process. Okay. So here Delta n is an IID sequence of ra random variables. Probability of delta is equal to plus 1 is p. Delta is equal to minus 1 is q, which is 1 minus p, and so on. So the game stops when Sn, not Xn. Sn is equal to 0 or Sn is equal to capital N. Okay. So what we are interested is the time are in the trial at which we either reach 0 or n, okay? Or let us say, um, yeah, so Ti is, we will call it as the stopping time. It is the minimum of i such that uh, xn becomes either 0 or n, okay? starting with the initial fortune i at x uh, with s0. 
Now what we are interested is in the following. We will denote by the notation P i n as the probability of uh, that when the game stops, you stop with a fortune of n. Okay, what it means? Starting with the initial fortune i, the probability of winning the whole game is what we will call it as capital P i of n. So tau i is the stopping uh, instant. X yes at the time tau i. If it is n, it means that you stop by winning. So this is the probability that the gambler wins, starting with an initial fortune of i, a zero as i. So p i of n denotes the probability that the gambler, starting the initial fortune i, reaches a total fortune of capital n before getting ruined. So probability of getting ruined is one minus p i of n. Well, certain things can be easily written down. What is p zero of n? Okay, that is here the subscript is the initial fortune. So if the initial fortune is zero, then then it is an absorbing state. You start with being in the absorbing state and you can never play, and probability of winning is equal to zero. So you can never win by starting with an initial fortune of zero. But on the other hand, if your initial fortune is initially capital N, you have already won, therefore P N N is equal to one. Okay, so we are interested in this quantity. So we are going to get this quantity by uh, looking at the extreme values for which we have found out. In general for P I of N, what is the value? That is not easy to find out. We starting with an example of zero, n as equal to 10 and p is equal to 0.5 and then fortune, initial fortune as p, it is not easy to figure out what will be the probability of winning and so on. But what we can do is, we can find the relationship between p i of n with values of i less than or equal to a given value. That is, we will try to connect the value p i of n with p i minus 1 of n and i plus 1 of n. Okay. So, in any given gamble that is trial, we know that that delta 1 is equal to 1. Okay. Delta 1 is equal to uh, uh, minus 1 with the probability p and q respectively. So, now what we will do is we will drop this subscript capital N because we know that capital N is the uh, fortune uh, needs to be attained for winning the game. So we will drop it for quickly. When we say P i is the probability of winning with an initial fortune i. So what is P i? Probability of winning the game with an initial fortune of i. Well, now if what we can write it in terms of p i plus 1 and p i minus 1. Suppose you start off with an initial fortune of i plus 1. Okay. Then suppose you are able to find this probability. Similarly, for the case of initial fortune of i minus 1, if you know the probability of winning and call it as p i minus 1. So p i p i plus 1 and p i minus 1 are all related. How? If you are in i to begin with, if you make a, a, a success in the initial first trial, you will go to i plus 1. And then probability of winning the game will be p i plus 1. So, there are only two possible events in the first trial, success or failure. Success occurs with the probability p in which case the probability of winning becomes p i plus 1. In case if it is a failure with the probability of q, your fortune is i minus 1, that can be treated as an initial fortune, as if the game restarts with an initial fortune of i minus 1. 
then the for probability of uh, winning the game is p i minus 1. So p i can be written as p into p i plus 1 plus q into p i minus 1. So that way the problem becomes more or related to uh, becomes easier in the sense that we have a recursive relationship between i, i plus 1 and i minus 1. Well now we will rewrite this equation. We know that p plus q is equal to 1. So we can always multiply pi by 1 and instead we can multiply it by p plus q. So I am multiplying on this side by p plus q. So p plus q into pi is equal to p into pi plus 1 plus q into i minus 1, pi minus 1. Now uh, rearrange it so that you will get p times pi plus, okay, we have only multiplied it, plus q times pi is equal to this. Now, pi plus 1 minus pi. So, you bring everything uh, multiplied by p on one side, everything, uh, the q factors on the other side. P times P i plus minus P P i plus 1 will be equal to Q times P i minus 1 it will be there. P i will also be here. Okay. So you will see that P i plus 1. So you are taking P to this side and Q to this side. So P i plus 1 minus P i will be equal to Q divided by P into P i minus P i minus 1. So that way this can be written. And this is true for i lying between 1 and n minus 1 inclusive. Okay. Therefore, p2 minus p1, taking i to be 1, p2 minus p1 is equal to q by p times p1 minus p0. Okay. But what is p0? p0 is 0 because P0 means starting with the initial fortune of 0, winning, which is not possible. Therefore, this is nothing but Q by P times P1. Now, for the case of I is equal to 2, we have P3 minus P2 is equal to Q by P times P2 minus P1. Okay. We have seen that P2 minus P1 is Q by P times P1. So, it is Q by P times Q by P times P1 or q by p the whole squared into p1. So this goes on. So in general what we can do is for uh, i up to n minus 1 we can write this equation. p i plus 1 minus p i is equal to q by p power i times p1. This is for i lying in between and inclusive 1 and n minus 1. So, what we have a set of equations like this. Okay, if we add um, all these equations between one and i minus one, these are the values of i for which these equations are valid. If we add all these things, if you look at this side, to begin with, we will have see p two minus p one, next p three minus p two. So the P2 is positive in one equation and negative another equation. It will get cancelled. Similarly, P3 minus P2 will be there. P4 minus P3 will be there. So if you add all these things, P2, P3, P4 and all up will get cancelled. So if you add up to I minus 1, what will remain is that PI will be there and P1 will be there. So we will get an equation p i minus p 1 is equal to sig sigma k varying from 1 to i minus 1 p k plus 1 minus p k. Okay. So this is true. And what is again this one? This is nothing but q by p power k times p 1. So again what we can do is we can also uh, extend this summation 
with an index 0 ok uh, how by moving p1 to this side so it is p1 plus whole of this one so k is equal to 0 means it is this is q by p power 0 which is 1 1 times p1 and that accounts for this one after being taken to this side so pi can be written in this form so this is a geometric series the uh, factor is q by p ok so we can uh, find the sum of this geometric finite series so uh, pi can be found out p1 is a common factor you take it out the remaining thing is what you have to do then you look at if first consider a case when q and p are different q is not equal to p then this is nothing but a fraction ok uh, then then what will happen is it is p1 times 1 minus q by p power i minus 1 plus 1 divided by 1 minus q by p so if you do a summation up to i minus 1 you will have i minus 1 plus 1 to be the power here so here you will have p1 times 1 minus q by p power i divided by 1 minus q by p this is the case from q not equal to p this is true even when q by p factor is a fraction less than 1 or greater than 1 if q by p is equal to 1 then the summation becomes easy so you are adding uh, 1 the one, 1 power k is 1 so you are adding p1 i times 0 to i minus 1 means i times so then it becomes p1 times i so so this is the general formula that we have got for p i so now if you put i is equal to n then we know for n p n is equal to 1 therefore we know that p n which is equal to 1 is nothing but this formula with i equal to n which is p 1 times 1 minus q by p power n by 1 minus q by p for q not equal to p and it is n times p 1 for q equal to p and see you know in, the, in this whole expression p1 is still not known we are interested in finding that then only you can write pi in terms of only the parameters of the system which is nothing but i q p and so on so to derive p1 only we are putting it in the expression for pn because pn is also known now 1 is equal to this quantity so p1 can be found out so in turn p1 is the inverse of this quantity which is 1 minus q by p divided by 1 minus q by p power n for q not equal to p and p1 will be 1 by n for q equal to p it means that q is equal to p is equal to 0.5 so this is what we have got therefore the expression for pi is pi is equal to this quantity ok so what here we have done is once we have found out p1 we can substitute it back in this equation now if you look at it for pi it is this times p1 which is sort of an inverse of this excepting that this factor is present in the numerator and gets cancelled on the denominator you will have 1 with n so you will have 1 minus q by p power i divided by 1 minus q by p power capital n which is true for q not equal to p and here we will have uh, i by n ok for this one so this is meaningful to some extent because you will see that for q is equal to p is equal to 0.5 it's sort of a fair game ok winning and lo uh, um, losing is equally probable so the probability that you will win depends upon i how close you are to uh, n so it is i by n 
other than that you are crucially dependent upon the factor which is q by p okay when q by p is okay mm, uh, less then you have a larger chances of winning q by p is less means p is more than q so this is how we can arrive at the probability of winning uh, in a uh, gambler's ruin problem so all these are also important because see in uh, you can also forecast the way the um, the climatic condition of uh, it even predicted that the uh, the, the um, there are two extreme uh, weather conditions to which the, the global uh, climatic condition will oscillate from year to year and probability of going to one of these two extremes can be viewed as a uh, motion in a double well potential and uh, again it is very similar to a uh, gambler's ruin problem and um, uh, that is one thing similarly the diffusion of ion and and so on similarly if in the case of a stock market one so there may be certain uh, threshold values when the stock hits certain threshold value which affects the psychology of the market then uh, the the value the stock market will the by which be rated will totally differ so you will be interested in how long it will take to go and so on here so far we have only bother found out what is the probability of uh, winning getting ruined starting from the initial value we can also find out the expected time it takes for the gambler to, uh, to get ruined given that the gambler gets ruined so those can also be found out we will see those as well. but now having looked at how a one dimensional markov chain model can be solved we will look at how, how of the general technique of solving markov chain given the one step transition probability matrix or the diagrammatic representation of markov chain so this is very important because once a markov chain is well defined assuming that the stationary state exists what will be the stationary probability density function so so far we will see some three examples in all these things we will assume that the stationary state exists in the later lecture we will look at the condition for stationary state to exist the limiting probability distribution to exist and so on so suppose you are given a ptm probability transition matrix and its value for a three state markov chain is given as follows the states are 0 1 2 p00 is 0 p01 is 0.5 p101 2 is 0.5 and so on suppose the steady state probability vector uh, exists and you want to find it you will denote it as pi which has three uh, elements pi1 pi2 pi3 pi1 is the probability that the system will be found in the state 1 at stationarity similarly pi2 pi3 we know that at stationarity pi is equal to pi into p because if you move one step ahead for which we have to multiply this row vector pi by this matrix p to get pi at the time n plus 1 from pi n from the nth time to n plus 1th time so it will not change at stationarity so pi n is also pi pi n plus 1 is also pi therefore we have this condition pi is equal to pi p so if you apply pi is equal to pi p you will get these equations imagine uh, mentally recall that there is pi 1 pi 2 pi 3 that multiplied by the first column is pi 1 times 0 plus pi 0 sorry pi 1 times 0 pi 2 point pi pi 3 into point 5 will be equal to pi 1 okay so pi 1 is equal to this similarly pi 1 into point 5 plus 0 plus pi 
2 into pi 3 into 0.5 is equal to pi 2. So we have got three equations, three unknowns. But of course, we have got one more equation that should also be satisfied, which is the normalization condition. That is pi 1 plus pi 2 plus pi 3 equal to 1. So if you use all these things, you can solve for it. And we can see that it will be equal to 1 by 3, 1 by 3, 1 by 3. Okay. Maybe you may be able to guess that by looking at that STM, you will see that all states are equivalent. In some sense, you will never remain in a state in the next time. That is why there is 0, 0, 0. You move to one state or another in the three state Markov chain with equal probabilities. So all states are an equal footing. Therefore, you don't uh, differentiate any state from another. So all should be equal probably, equally probable in the long run. Well, now here is a case that that is not a case. That is, they are not equiprobable. They move between states with different probabilities. So the STM is like this. Then again, applying pi is equal to pi t, you will get that pi 1 is given by 0.5 pi 1 plus 0.3 pi 2 0.2 pi 3. Pi 2 will be given by 0.4 pi 1 plus 0.4 pi 2 plus 0.3 pi 3 and so on. And normalization condition, you can solve for it and get a value of the stationary probability. Suppose you are given a Markov chain diagram and you want to solve this and assume that stationary state exists. One way is that you can construct a uh, TPM, transition probability matrix easily. So what will happen is call A as the zero state, B as the first state, C as the second state. What is P zero zero? Self-loop. If there is no self-loop, it is zero. So zero to one is point one, zero to two is point nine, so you have got the first row, 0, 0, 0.1, 0, 0.9. Similarly, the second row will have B to A. So it is 0 0.1 will be the first element of the second row. Then the uh, 1, 1 is 0, 1, 3 is 0 0.9 and so on. That is one way and then you can proceed as like this. You can also do one more thing. Suppose you are at stationary state then the probability of occupying state A will not, is not going to change. So if you look at this one and consider the probability of remaining in a state, in the state A at a given time, which we call it as pi A, what will be the probability of coming to state A in the next time? At a given time, probability of being in A is pi A. What is the probability that a system in any given state will come to A? It is only, the only way it is possible is from A you cannot remain in A. You can be in B and come to A or you can be in C and come to A. So the probability of coming to A from an arbitrary state is probability of being in B, which is pi B, into the probability of making a transition from B to A, which is 0 0.1, so 0 0.1 times pi B, into probability of being in state C, that is pi C, into making a C to A transition, which is 0 0.5. So what we do is, we add up the sum of all incoming probabilities, that is the probability of being in a state and making a transition. So you look at all arrow marks which lead to A. Find the probability of going there. How? Probability of being in a state multiplied by the transition probability along the arc. And that should be equated to the probability of being in a state. If you do it for each of these states, you will get three equations. For a state B, you write as P pi B is equal to pi A into point 0.1 plus pi c into 0.5 and for pi c it is pi a into 0 0.9 plus pi b into 0 0.9 and again the normalization condition with solving all these things you would be able to get the probabilities of occupancy of a b c 
So we have looked at how the random walk phenomenon can be modeled and analyzed. We also looked at how a Markov chain model, if a stationary probability exists, how do we solve it and arrive at the steady state probability distribution. So we will stop at this point. We will look at in the next lecture under what conditions stationary probability condition exists, how do we classify different states and look at the properties of the Markov chain based on the states. Thank you.